All right, all right. Let's get our Facebook groups in here before it's time to start the show for an episode of Building the Broncos. We got spinning wheel one and two. All right, welcome in, welcome in. It is 5.04 p.m. where I'm at, 6.04 Mountain Time. And it's uh, April 2nd time for an episode of Building the Broncos. I am Nick Kendall. Tuesday night, joined by Carl Dummler once again. Carl, thanks for holding down the fort last Tuesday as I uh, got to show my sister around Seattle for the she, first time uh, she'd been here since I moved out here. So it's good hanging out with the family for a bit. And uh, of course, they had pretty bad weather and it was beautiful as soon as they left. But uh, what can you do? Yeah, I mean, you and I both live in places that you never quite know what you're going to get from day to day. And, uh, you know, like I, I said on the show last week, we had blizzard, hailstorm, um, torrential rain pour on all in about a two hour period last week. And this week, nice and sunny. It's supposed to be mid 60s, high mid 70s, somewhere in there. All the snow's already melted. It, it just, yeah. So stinks that they didn't get the, the best of Seattle because the, the best yeah. of Seattle those days, oh my gosh. Those are incredible. You know, I like I've lived there for a couple of years and my wife and I love to go on some hikes. And any day that we got one of those times, we were outside. Yeah, my uh, brother in law was out here and he really wanted to go out and do something. And uh, weather didn't really align. You know, I have a chance to have the baby taken care of and not have my wife be alone with the baby as well. You know, like because, you know, I'm just having some help and uh, nope, weather didn't align. So they're not a long enough window. Hopefully they can come back in the summer and we can. Uh, climb some mountains or catch some fish or something, but that'd be good. We still got to get your butt out here uh, at some point, hopefully as well, but uh, let's get into the show. Enough of that fun stuff talking about ahead. We got fun stuff right in front of us with the NFL draft. And we're talking about Mike Kliss uh, talking about uh, the NFL draft, the Broncos over on let's talk Broncos. Uh, I don't believe we have rivals out here, Carl or competitors. We have friends and compatriots. I don't yeah. really have many rivals. Uh, so uh, Zach, so we, we Breen, talk to them all. I, I don't know. I mean, some people are a little bit not as nice as the others, but it's like I don't put that much effort into disliking people. Right. It's just, yeah, I have enough hate for prospects to hate people in the, the Twitter sphere. Uh, so or anything like that. So let's talk Broncos. Zach, uh, Joey and Bree had Mike Kliss on and he talked about the Broncos stuff and they had some interesting tidbits there from one of the best Broncos insiders. It's uh, Mike Kliss and uh, Chris Thomason. I can, can, he's kind of, I'm somewhat relatively newer to him, but he does, he's been doing a phenomenal job, uh, as well. So really good insiders there, but let's say hello to some people in the chat. Uh, let's say hello. We got string guy coming in and says, I think Joe Milton is a better option, better option than what Uh string guy. I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe talking, I don't know. Is there a picture of Bo Nix or something on the cover? I mean, you might be able to get Joe on the fourth where Nix, you probably have to take round two, uh, we'll see with the first round stuff. I just, I'm still having a hard time buying it, especially talking to people not connected to the Broncos, but all it takes is one team. Uh, but yeah, I know Milton, the better option. Maybe man, he's big and he's got a huge arm. He's not Anthony Richardson because Richardson's like an edge rusher caliber athlete. Uh, but Milton's got a hell of an arm. Yeah. I, my, my issue there is you, you know, you're going to need at least a year, maybe two to get him developed. And for a coach, like if that's what you're depending on, and then you're just going to try to set up a couple veterans, obviously you're, you're going to be making a move other than Milton. Like, I don't mind if you take Bo Nix early on yeah. and then Milton day three sometime. Yeah. And you just try to see, Hey, okay, this is the higher upside guy, but this is the guy we know can start day one for the next couple of years. We can get pretty good production from him. And then we'll see what Milton brings. Like if he's mm -hmm. reached that peak, then we could trade Bo Nix for, a decent draft pick, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, even an average quarterback will get you a, at least a second round pick in, in today's NFL sphere. Unless you're Justin yeah. Fields. Right? <laughs> That's true. Well, depends on where you rate, uh, if you consider him middle of the pack or not, but, but anyway, still, still this year, the draft. Yeah. Yeah. You can still get a little bit, but, uh, that, that's the way that I would go about it. If I'm thinking Milton has that kind of high upside, because again, otherwise, good chance your coach is gone before you ever get a chance to actually see what he could bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we got uh, talking also we got DTR coming in. I think Bonix Flores, Andy Dalton and ceiling is Drew Brees. Well, if that's the case. Denver better take him at 12. Uh, I think, I think we're underrating how good Drew Brees's arm was and athleticism coming out of Purdue. Uh, maybe the arm is like Drew Brees in the last 
five years of his career in the NFL, but I don't think it's, I mean, Drew Brees could whip it. Uh, my floor and ceiling for um, Bo Nix, and I got, I'll give credit to Nate Tice and Dane Brugler, but they are a little harsher on Nix than I am. Uh, they were talk- comparing him consistently to Taylor Heineke. I think that's the floor uh, for Bo Nix to Taylor Heineke, you know, doesn't really push the football too much when he does. It's like somewhat questionable and not really work in the middle of the field consistently. Uh, and the ceiling, I think, you know, just some of the quick game stuff, the pre-snap stuff that he does. I think the seal and being an athlete when needed, I think the ceiling is Dak Prescott. Uh, so that's the range I'm looking at for Bonix. And that'd be a, a hell of an outcome. I know there's, you know, I would love Dak on Denver. I think he's a really good quarterback. Uh, but uh, that's, that's where I'm at with Bo. Yeah. I, I think that's a pretty good range, honestly. And comparing him to a hall of famer, you know, the, the odds of him ever living up to that is going to be very hard. Um, you know, obviously I want him to be, I want him to be Drew Brees and, and bring what Drew Brees brought to, to the saints with Sean Payton all those years. That would be incredible to watch. Um, the, the battles between him and Mahomes for years. Oh my gosh. That, that would be a legendary quarterback duo going on right there. But, uh, He's still got definitely a long ways to go in his game to to get there. I think he, I do think he is a really good fit with the Broncos. Honestly, I think most of the quarterbacks, just because Sean Payton's one of those guys, he he can build an offense around what works for a quarterback. Taysom Hill, Jameis Winston, Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, I mean, Tony Romo there for a bit uh, when he was the Cowboys, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, Drew Brees, like a lot of different styles there uh, for what worked. What he does need is a quarterback who can consistently work the middle of the field somewhat and play on time. I think those were two non-negotiables and that made the Russell Wilson marriage doomed from the start, but we don't have to go down that road again. <laughs> <laughs> we got Mike Woodward coming in saying evening, everyone. Good to see you, Mike. Glad you could join us. And Rob Buxbaum coming in with the $5 super saying evening gents thoughts on taking a quarterback until third round or later and using 12 or a trade back to fill in the roster holes. I think that's a very legit option here. I don't think you have been cornered into having to take a quarterback at this time. You know, this is a a true rebuild and a rebuild doesn't happen in one year unless you're Houston who has two top 10 picks and, you know, lots of cap space to fill out the roster and, and just, they had a lot of things going in their direction to make them set up well. And they already had like up and coming young cost controlled talent. Denver yep. has not drafted a player in the top 50 of the draft since Javonta Williams. Since Javonta Williams, they've not drafted a player in the top 50. Uh, so like they had up and like Nico Collins all of a sudden emerges. Well, kind of, uh, he's been there, right? And then once you get the quarterback and kind of see him take off, they had some assortment of investments in there that were building. Mm-hmm. Denver's missing that like gut right now to the roster yeah. because of the moves they've made. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, trading back, getting some more cost controlled assets. It's, I was, I think that's a viable strategy. My big question is, I mean, why, why now? Why did, why did we trade up for Marvin Mims last year? Riley Moss last year? You know, I just, I was still having, I having a hard time with the dissonance between the moves last season to where we are now, because it felt, pr- I mean, good for Peyton and everybody, you know, giving it a full effort with uh, Wilson and everything and seeing if it'll work. But what looking at the roster, it felt like, eh, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't think that the, I mean, heck Carl, I remember leaving the Broncos versus Seahawks game week one. And I'm like, uh Oh, <laughs> that didn't look good. <laughs> that, but uh, uh-huh. that's uh, I don't know. I have the disconnect there. bothers me, but yeah, trading yeah. back is definitely viable and you could trade back and take a quarterback, taking a quarterback round three. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about quarterback here coming up, but any other thoughts, uh, Carl on this and also shout out to Rob with the super chat, keeping the lights on. Uh, we need to keep those super chats going because then some people in my p- periphery are a little bit more amenable to uh, more shows, right? So uh, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, keeps keeps the lights on for sure, but keeps also Nick the host on here. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree. I think you got to start really rebuilding your, your draft capital to fill out this team because it's been missing for so long. And if that means trading back from 12, getting an extra second round pick, maybe even 2025 capital. So then when you do go for your quarterback, you've got more ammo to, to be able to trade up, whatever that is. Um, Broncos definitely need players all over the field. I mean, I, there, there's not really a position that I'm like, that is really set guard. You could say starters are definitely set mm-hmm. tackle. 
at least right now, pretty well set, but you're still looking at a possible replacement coming up here pretty soon with Garrett Bowles getting towards the end of his contract and getting older. Um, obviously, tight end needs it. Wide receiver needs it. Quarterback needs it. On defense, every level needs some kind of a talent implosion or explosion within that group. So um, I, I don't think you can go wrong by trying to add as many players cost controlled, like you said, so that when you do get that quarterback, then all of a sudden you can get really aggressive and, and do whatever you want. I, I want a quarterback this year just because I'm not patient. And I, I think Sean Payton is not the most patient guy in the world. I mean, I, you talked about that trade up last year. Twice. Yeah, twice. He's he's not a patient guy. He's like, I want this guy because I think he can help me now. That's who he's been most of his career. And for better or for worse, I mean, he's gotten a lot of really talented players there in the Saints through the draft. But are the Broncos in that kind of position? I don't know. So I, I don't know if he's the best coach for a rebuild because of that impatience. That, that's my out, big right? worry here. Yep. We're going to find out. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. Corey comes in and says, what if we trade Sertan for a top 20 first round? It's going to cost more than that. Uh, plus 2025 20, picks and draft a zone corner so that Moss can be effective and reset cost control. Riley and Cooper would be fun. I think you're probably a year off from any potential Sertan moves still. If the team was like completely horrible and Sertan was asking for more than they'd be willing to pay and it seems like they're, you know, two years away from being a year away, then maybe you have that conversation just because of the cornerback window being six, seven years before they fall off dramatically uh, most of the time. So I think you're a year away from that. Ideally, you know, you, you have a positive momentum and direction and you can bring Sertan back, but definitely something to uh, something to consider, right? Until he's signed a long-term contract and that dead money uh, makes it pretty hard to do. Uh, then, uh, there's he's his name's going to be floated out there just because the Broncos are not a very good team right now and need assets. Uh, Dakota Marquez come in five dollars says Nick's Penix and McCarthy in no particular order. I'd be happy going in with the season. I think that, yeah, this is this is possible. Uh, I I don't know if I agree with a tier. He said no particular order. I think McCarthy is a tier above Nick's and Penix, and I would bet pretty good money that he goes before both of those guys. Uh, but yeah, those are all possible ones, and heck. Uh, we'll see what happens. I would love McCarthy at 12. I, I would like McCarthy at 12. I think that we kind of jump shark maybe a little bit with him. Brand, a lot of the stuff they talk about him is intangibles and off the field and, and you know, what he could do if he actually got to drop back more. I mean, well, kind of feels like the Trey Lance conversation when we start doing that. And I like McCarthy. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but Nixon Penix at 12, not as much for me. That's okay. Yeah, I, I kind of wonder if McCarthy was the same age as those other two we probably wouldn't be having that same conversation because there is a lot more of the potential compared to the true, this is what he's done on the field mm -hmm. where we're yep. Pennix and Knicks for better, for worse. We kind of know what they are. We've seen what they can do on the field. We can, we've seen the strengths and the weaknesses McCarthy. Yeah. I mean, he's still got a very high ceiling. And so are you willing to bank on that? And I agree. I think he's probably ahead of those other two because that ceiling can still go up. Where, yeah. where Nixon Penix, some of it's going to depend on where they go. You know, they need to go to the right system, to the right coach. And, and this is where the Broncos, they are at a very good spot because Sean Payton is a great offensive mind. You know, I'd put Minnesota's situation ahead of theirs for any young quarterback coming into it that is set up well. You know, they have yeah. a great offensive court, offensive minded coach. They've got incredible weapons. They've got a good offensive line. There's a lot of good set up for any rookie quarterback to come in and be successful. Broncos mm -hmm. don't have all of that. No. But like I said, with Sean Payton, he could really get the most out of a lot of these guys. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, Knicks and Penix. I, I, I'm okay with, yeah, I'm okay with any of these three, just kind of depending where you take them. At pick 12, it's probably McCarthy. If it's end of round one, I'm okay with Penix and Knicks. Yeah, and there's some people who I really respect their football analysis and that doesn't mean they're always right because trying to project quarterbacks is freaking hard uh but there are some people i really respect that actually have rattler ahead of nixon Penix as a quarterback prospect entering this so that's my next tier i don't know if i want to i feel like okay with where i have the guys that at tiers right now uh but separating the ones in the tiers 
Ah, uh, don't make me choose. <laughs> that's uh, I know that's the job at the end of the day, right? But it's uh, it's tough. Zach Powers coming in says afternoon, fellas. Hope you're doing well. We got Gabe in the house saying howdy, howdy. Kathy, Kathy Lund says hi, fam. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. I'm feeling a little better. I had this Monday show by myself and uh, definitely had to take a lot of pause breaks for blowing the nose and some coughs. But hey, uh, we're we're alive. We're here and we're alive. That's what counts. Michael Ronquillo. Good evening, Nick and Carl and building the Broncos. Go Broncos. Go Michael. Good to see you. Um, we got, I'm the man coming in saying, choose kindness, choose compassion, choose edge, <laughs> move back. If McCarthy and maybe gone. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm the man. And we'll see what happens, uh, with the Broncos there, Paul in the house and Nick and Carl. Hello. OGs. Paul, you're an OG. Hope you're doing well. Pearl heaters in the house. Welcome to Colorado weather changes by the minute. Yeah. I mean, that mountain weather is crazy. I was going to say not to go too far down that, but I wouldn't say the weather is unpredictable here, Carl. We're almost, I've heard people argue that we're like more of a Mediterranean climate where it's like it's really overcast and wet in the winter and then it's dry and sunny in the summer so which can lead to yeah. force from a whole bunch of stuff but it's i think we're pretty predictable in the weather in seattle honestly but they missed just perfect weather to so boohoo bad luck <laughs> i think it's it's when it does that change yeah from the the rainy season to the dry season there's like a few days of really good so you're like oh yeah now we're going into this and all of a sudden that rain comes back for like two weeks and then, so just that, that change, that's what I was mostly talking about. You just don't know when it's going to completely flip over. Yeah, absolutely. And I know this name, Darren Kendall. Hey dad, how you doing? Thank you so much. He said, uh, good evening, gentlemen. Now let's keep the lights on for the MHH followers. Well, you can just directly Venmo me, dad. No, the, that's okay. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Hope you're doing well. DTR with the $5 super chat says evening MHH fam. Assuming the first round pick is quarterback. How do we feel about Muhammad Kamara in the third? I think that he's a little lacking in juice uh, for me to I mean, he's okay. Size to power, right? I think or the speed to power he's twitched up, but he's pretty damn small. Uh, and I think probably 76, a little early. I'm thinking more fourth or fifth round uh, for me personally. I mean, there's a lot of good tape there at Colorado state. The other thing is I just edge rusher to me is pretty much a top 50 or bust kind of pick if possible given the historic hit rate. Now, granted, it's a rotational position. You can find good players outside of the first 30 to 50 picks. But if you go through like Pro Bowls, All Pros, uh, PFF Top 10s over and over again, edge rushers, interior defensive linemen, and offensive tackle, absolutely littered with first-round picks. So I start to look at, you know, tight end. Maybe you're the depth wide receiver there. Uh, interior defensive line is okay down there. You can still find quality players. Linebacker, uh, those are the spots I'm looking at. Edge is one where I'm like, ah, we need juice. Like, do I, would it be nice to get another Jonathan Cooper in here to kind of reset the contract and, you know, let him phase out or Baron Browning phase out, that kind of thing? Sure. Uh, but typically, I'm looking for Edge with a premium selection. Yeah. Like I said, for a rotational guy, you could do much, much worse than him. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking at him to become your true all around starter, th there's definitely some parts to his game that leave you yeah. wanting more. You know, he is short for an edge guy, short arms. Yeah. So a lot of tackles are going to be able to get into his body and in college, he could get away with it. In the Mountain you know, West. Like, <laughs> yeah. And especially in the Mountain West where he could really use that, that power and speed to really set up some moves. And the NFL, that's just not going to be the case where he can get away with some of the things that he did. And so again, I think as a situational guy, I don't mind him, but I'm not using a third round pick on a situational guy. I mean, I could, I could talk myself into like, you know, maybe one of the compensatory picks. If you make some moves and you get one, like, a, you know, what was it? Baron Browning pick 105 or something. You're like yeah. very end of the third round. But 76 is a pretty good pick. And typically when I've run through simulations and guys there, there's talent I like more on that spot. So I think I'd be willing to risk that he's going to be there a little later. Chase to see in the pipeline, but we got to get to this Ooh. big time super chat. Flashing red, man, in a good way. Uh, not like a baboon's you-know-what, but uh, love you both from EJ. Says, tons of insight for the Broncos, but also both of you are great young humans. I don't know about the young part. I uh, <laughs> go to like the bathroom and fluorescent, fluorescent light in the office now. It's like, oh my God, who is that old man? Wrinkles everywhere, white. I, did you watch Game of Thrones? No. No? Okay, well. Okay. Uh, well, there's a character named, uh, his nickname is Littlefinger, and he's got like jet black hair in the top and just stark white on the side. And I am getting... yeah. White on the side, baby. But uh, hey, man, this is my skunk stripes. It's okay. I, I uh, what can you Where do? Pride. Yeah, I mean, heck, I might be able to get some uh, 
what are the what are the Nivea, Nivea for men? I don't even know what the the age stuff is for men to ha- change your hair color. But uh, with hundred dollars super chats, maybe we can get some of that brown back in there. <laughs> Thank you so much, EJ. We appreciate yes. you. that's that is that is so kind. Uh, awesome. It really you. is so kind. Yeah. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, let us know. <laughs> Chase Wellner comes in five dollars. Says, "Hey fellas, let's say they trade back and get a mid second round pick. They could land any of the non quarterbacks in that range. Who is your pick?" Well, I'm hoping they get more than a mid-second round pick from trading back. I'm hoping it's a first round pick and a mid-second in that scenario. Uh, So, I mean, some of it's going to depend on who's available uh, in that first round pick and which direction you go. Let me just pull up a consensus big board uh, just to see like that range right there. We've done I've done some mocks where I've seen some guys there. Go ahead. I'll list a couple names. Um, Darius Robinson from Missouri. Mm-hmm. Kind of a defensive tackle, defensive end. You know, he's big enough to to move inside when you need him to, but he can also head, hold up on the edge. Mm-hmm. Broncos don't have an edge guy like him. They don't have someone with that kind of size that can really bring that kind of power to the game. I think he would be a, a really nice pick for the Broncos. Um, Ricky Purcell, six foot one, 192 pound wide receiver from Florida. I think he would be a, a great player in a Sean Payton offense. I, I think that would be a, another nice one for them. Um, Jatavian Sanders, if we're looking at tight end, 6'4", 243. You know, there's a big drop-off from Bowers to that next tight end. But I think there's kind of a pretty bit decent drop-off from from Sanders to that next year as well. And I think he'd be a pretty good athlete for the Broncos to have. And, and it keeps that Texas group going. You know, we're going to be all all Texas here pretty soon. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm okay with that if you're getting that kind of player. I know the Broncos paid for wide receiver and you got Tim Patrick here still, but it's just such a talented class. You mentioned, you mentioned Pearsall, maybe Xavier Worthy falls down that far. Lad McConkey, Roman Wilson, all some guys that make some sense in that range. I mean, if you're talking mid second round pick, can we talk Penix, Rattler, Knicks? We already did, but that's kind of where, I mean, I think it's possible for sure. Uh, you got um, Sumati Ai, uh, the tackle slash guard from BYU. He might make some sense down there that far. Uh, Adisa Isaac from Penn State, edge rusher. Um, he, I thought he did really well at the uh, the Senior Bowl. Tested really well, also, and then just a bunch of defensive tackles. I mean, Rook Orohiro, uh That's not Scooby Doo saying, "Uh oh." Uh, that's a uh, <laughs> Clemson defensive tackle. Pretty raw, but tested really well. Got to figure out how to use his hands a little better. Uh, but he stands out for me. Marshawn Neeland. I would love Marshawn Neeland down there. Another defensive tackle, Chris Jenkins, stands out. Uh, maybe somebody like uh, Brandon Fisk might be there in the mid second round. I mean, there's some good uh, defensive tackles available in that range. Also, maybe you start to bring it back to our topic today. Uh, Mike Kliss did an interview with uh, let's talk Broncos and talked a lot about running back. I mean, early second feels a little bit early for running back, but maybe you start to talk about your Trey Benson's, your Jonathan Brooks, your Blake Corum's. And uh, there's another name that's deserving of, being talked about. I talked about him on Monday. I can't think of who it is right now. Oh, um, Jalen Wright. Wright the guy that, Jalen Wright, the actually one who was linked to the Broncos. Uh, but uh, I think that's a little early. I'd probably wait until the third. But those are guys that stand. I really like the interior defensive lineman value uh, there in that range. I think that's probably where I would lean. Yeah. Yeah, no, th- there's definitely some good names there. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Xavier Leggett. Yep. For wide receivers, another one that I really wouldn't mind at that time. Um, oh, man, just because wide receivers are always, you know, something I'm looking at. And, I, and, I, and the Broncos need to get yeah. some new blood in the wide receiver room moving forward yeah. because I don't know if Sutton or Tim Patrick will be there beyond this season. And um, Scott and I did a trade back on Thursday in the Broncos draft, and we ended up taking – we got a second mid-second round pick, and we took uh, Zach Frazier. Uh, center from West Virginia, where I'm not sure where his range will be, but he would be awesome (laughs) in the mid second round. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens with the centers. I think Barton's going to go first. We'll see if JPJ makes in the first, apparently there's some injury concern, Uh, but uh, Frazier is a one that would be a lot of fun, Uh, especially after Clint Miners. Any like cornerbacks that you were, you'd be interested in? God, uh, looking at the big board here, let me just pull up cornerbacks uh, using I'm just using PFF's board just for sorting purposes. Not that I yeah. you know, totally agree with their rankings. Uh, maybe Max Melton uh, down there that far, but I feel like that's a round three guy. I mean, this is just 
it is not a very good cornerback class. I like some of the depth available later, but like day two, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Kyrie Jackson, pure There's... press. Enos Rakestraw didn't test well. Lassiter tested horribly. Santra still is like a pure nickel. Maybe TJ Tampa, but I didn't love his testing. It's not, just, it's not a good corner class. Yeah, there's like three or four in the first round that you really like. And then day two, not very good. And then you got some developmental guys that you might like later on that can help in special yeah. teams early on. Um, it, it is that kind of draft. There's it's just missing that middle group. There's just a really big drop off from those first ones to that next group. So, yeah, yeah I, I just I didn't know if there was any names you really like there because um, cornerback, I, I keep going back and forth. You did trade it for Riley Moss last year. And at some point, you really got to sit there and say, okay, we got to trust that our draft picks are going to do something for us, the ones we did get. So do you trust him to step into that number two cornerback spot? Or do you sit there and say, hey, we didn't see enough. We've got to go add to this room. I mean, they probably should be able to add somebody. Uh, we'll see what the scheme is. I'm curious to see what Jim Leonard's impact will be on the defensive backs and what they're doing. But you're right. I think that probably you could bring in a day three guy just to compete, but you hope Cooper Mathis slash maybe another veteran in there can be good. And Cliss mentioned it uh cornerback a bit on the, uh, the interview saying that like teams, a lot of times don't really look or value having like two number one cornerbacks as much. Like if you have a Patrick Sertan, there's maybe even a little bit less value of having another number one, especially with what you can do with your safeties, you know, playing almost double coverage opposite of your elite cornerback. Uh, yeah. And if you can't get, this is not something close to that, but my opinion and talking with uh, Cody Alexander, uh, who does a lot of good football, right? Of the defensive side, all the best cornerbacks in football, especially ones that played uh, like all the all pros and the ones that played a lot of man coverage and cover one. It's not because of the cornerback. It's because of their ability up front, uh, the ability to get home without blitzing uh, to protect yourself a little bit while still playing man coverage. And Broncos were dreadful at that last year. One of the bottom five pass rush defenses in football. Uh, they were very predicated on blitzing. I mean, they just could not get home with four at all. Uh, so you're trying to do that with cover one. Good luck. I mean, Sertan, he's probably what would you say? One of the top five man cornerbacks in football, right? Yeah. I think he was 34th in man reps last season. And it's not because he can't play man. And I don't think it's a Vance Joseph scheme per se either. I think it's, we don't got the guys to get home in order to play man coverage. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of out on, go ahead. What? I was just going to say Vance Joseph usually likes to play a lot of man coverage. You know, yeah. he, he likes to be a lot more aggressive, but I'll cover two. when you don't, when you don't have the talent, yeah. you got to adjust to it. And I think as the season went on, we got to see a lot of those adjustments happen. And yes, they got some lucky breaks with some of the turnovers, but I do think you saw a lot of the, Big time changes, you know, going zone on the back end, up front, a lot of different, what would you call them? I, different kinds of blitzes, but also just different kinds of, of switching and, you know, just trying to get any kind of pressure that you could because yeah. you knew your talent wasn't going to win a whole lot one-on-one. -on -one. So yeah. you had to get creative up front just to try to get any kind of pressure you could. Yep. And they did a good job at that last year, but uh, then they talked about a lot, you know, getting better up front and stopping the run to get to those exotics on third down. So we'll see what they do. Uh, I think that the Broncos have made a decision to take a step back defensively uh, somewhat this season while still holding on to a lot of their offensive assets and uh, trying to build that offense if they get a quarterback this year in the student future. And I believe that it's probably, I do believe it's easier to build a defense quickly uh, through free agency and other means than it is an offense. I think you need to build yeah. that offensive infrastructure first. We've seen a lot of teams do that. They've gone through free agents smart and then boom, they go from a bottom five defense to a top 10 defense uh, just from some smart free agents. And there's guys available on the defensive side, maybe besides edge rushers. Broncos built that 2015 defense from free agency. Part, I mean, part of it. I, I shouldn't I say mean, all of it. Vaughn, right? But yeah, <laughs> you, you've got Vaughn. Don't get me you wrong. You had Derek Wolf, perfectly. Malik Jackson. Yeah. Those were all draft picks. Um, but then you had Aqib Talib, Darian Stewart, um, Demarcus Ware, TJ Ward. <sighs> I'm trying to remember. Seems like that one linebacker that was from from free agency, Brandon Marshall. Oh yeah, Brandon Marshall. Um, Darian Stewart. So yeah, th yeah. Th there was there was a lot of guys. I mean, it was it was a nice mix. That's what you can do. Mm -hmm. 
offense, usually a lot of those players are not getting away. Like if they're hitting free agency, there's a big reason why they're hitting free agency. Yeah, especially at wide receiver and offensive tackle. Right. Now, defensive players, I mean, even this last free agent, you know, it's still going on right now. But you look at, there were some really good edge rushers that hit free agency. You know, Daniel, uh, Danelle Hunter was one. Um, oh, man, I'm spacing on some names here today. But um, but still, like I said, there, there was actually a lot. You had safety class. Oh, my gosh. Free agency safety. That was the best safety free agency we've ever seen. And there's still yeah. some big – I mean, Justin Simmons is still out there. Some team is going to get really fortunate and get him on a cheaper deal than they should. And they're going to have an all-pro safety added to their defense. Like you don't see a whole lot of those kind of talent, like I said, being available for offense. Yeah. Maybe guards uh, and guards and running backs. <laughs> uh, William James Baker comes in and says that morning Broncos country will ball as well. Def agreed trade back and get some picks back and get Knicks. Knicks is one of the many options, but if you're trading back from 12, you are saying to the NFL world uh, that you are okay living in a world where you don't get him as well. If you um, it's kind of like the Broncos trading back twice in, uh, or skipping him twice, uh, Drew Locke in 2019. We like Drew Locke, we don't love him. And it worked out where you could get him and take a shot in a value range that made sense for the risk. Didn't really work out. I mean, honestly, for a mid-second round quarterback, he's now, you know, third contract still in the league. I'd say, I mean, he's probably hit about average uh, for mm-hmm. that range of quarterback selection. Uh, but I digress. So that's probably what that says. It doesn't mean he's bad uh, or anything, but it just means, you know, you're trying to play the value game there as much as you can. Uh, we got Doug comes in and says, I see all six quarterbacks going in the first round. It's possible. I mean, if you got quarterbacks like Tua Tagovailoa going to get paid, you know, crazy money for, I think, a pretty mediocre quarterback. Uh, then, you know, Kirk Cousins getting paid what he did at, what, 36, 37, 38 years old or whatever the heck he is, too. There's a lot of value uh, to have that first round quarterback contract. So we'll see. Um, I will say, though, first round grade is a lot different than first round pick, right? Teams typically only have 14 to 20 first round grades in in a given year. And a lot of times those back end guys are, you know, round two, two, three grades. And then you have the round bump for quarterbacks. So you might be having round three graded quarterbacks going in the back of the first round. So, and I, I don't think that works out all that often for teams, but uh, you know, there's, you don't know this quarterback so hard because like, it's not a high, outside of like the top three picks, top five, right? Where you sit there and you didn't trade up for the guy. Not really high hit rate historically last 10, 15 years. But at some point you have to take the shot, right? Yeah. I can't think of what's the game. Is it shoots and ladders or can you land? Like at the very end before you win the game, you have to like risk it all or something. And then if you lose, you like scoot way back. It's kind of like that with quarterback, right? Like eventually you got to take that shot. Yeah. But if you miss, it hurts. So don't be wrong. Or a lot of people are fired. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And, and it is, it's not even always the talent of the quarterback that makes or breaks how successful or failure they are. Absolutely. That's why I keep talking about where they go makes a big difference. Like Drake may goes to Minnesota and new England. I think there's a really big difference in his career output Yeah, and it has nothing to do with his talent overall. You know, he, he's, he's a very talented player. I just think, especially with quarterbacks in today's NFL, they've got to go to a good situation. And, you know, since we were talking about him earlier, Justin Fields. Now, maybe he would have been a bust even if he went to the best situation possible. But Chicago gave him no chance. You know, the first two years they were in cap hell. So they were like sending pieces away on an already not talented team and trying to say, Justin Fields, go out there and win these games with nobody to throw to. And an offensive line that really stinks and is always banged up. Uh, you know, that, that's asking way too much of a young player. There, there's only, I would say, two or three quarterbacks in NFL history that I would sit there and say, I don't think it would have mattered where they went. They were going to be successful. You know, Peyton Manning, he was going to be successful no matter where he went in the NFL, just because he's that that good. Uh, Joe Montana, I'd put him up there. He was going to be successful. I mean, and he went to a really good situation. Yeah. Perfect. Not a lot of people love the arm talent, right? Uh, so uh, just the, the West Coast system with Joe Walsh. It's But it's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, right? Who Andrew knows? Luck. Yeah, Andrew Luck was one that came to mind because that was yeah. a garbage fire team. I mean, 
Still kind of is with the, uh, we won't get into the ownership. Uh, Kathy coming in <laughs> saying, hi, I'll just listen tonight. Well, you know, you can hang out too and say hello. Uh, Michael brings up a good point. Yeah. Broncos new uniform re- uh, reveal April 22nd. So that'll be a lot of fun. Um, I will say I am uh, concerned about what it's going to look like, but you know, it, it is what it is. Uh, it's I'm also, I see a lot of people talking about the uniforms and like the old school stuff being, you know, a curse or whatever. It's like, well, listen, the worst years we've had in this team since before, like in the 1950s were this current uniform design and logo. So like, I don't think there's any superstition, not the jerseys that win the games. It's the players and the jerseys. So miss me with the, Oh, those are bad luck ones. (laughs) Hell no. Just bad players, not bad luck. Yeah. I, I thought about having that be our subject for tonight because that was the big news that kind of came out from the Denver Broncos. I was like, man, it's jerseys. How much can you really say other than, oh, they might be good, they might be bad. I don't know. And we'll just have to deal with it when it happens. Um, I I don't get too much into it. I'm hoping they'll be good, obviously. But I, I'm trying to keep my expectations low so then I can be pleasantly surprised instead of having all this hype built up into it and then being like, oh, really? Okay, great. They're going to have throwbacks, though. And yeah. those are going to be sick because we know those look fire, uh, at least in my opinion. Eric Smith comes in and says, think we'll see a day when VJ is gone and Jim Leonard takes his spot. I think Vance Joseph has a warm seat coming into the season. Uh, so I wouldn't be shocked. Now, granted, I, again, I don't think the talent level is great on the defensive side of the ball. You got Sertan and Allen and then Hope on a lot of those other guys. You know, Let's see if we can repeat performance for McMillan. Uh, hopefully Browning can stay healthy. We'll see what happens with the safety. He's, he's, yeah, he's fine. He's good. He makes a lot yeah. of tackles. Um, he's a, he's a useful piece. Good defenses have a singleton on them. You hope he's not one of the first eight you list though. Yeah. Uh, when you're make, making a defense, but we'll see uh, a lot of young players and guys can still emerge uh, and t- or take next steps. Right. Uh, Daniel Barry comes in and says evening, everyone. Good to see you. Draft day podcasts are usually great. Yeah, sometimes. Um, you know, it's, it's I, we have a lot of fun, but man, they are a grind and a half. So we're uh, making the best of it. Hope uh, we got James Edwards coming in too, saying, "What would you think about the Broncos taking a stab at recruiting Andrew Luck out of retirement and re-signing Justin Simmons?" I mean, that would be pretty fun. I think. The thing about Andrew Luck is I don't know if you've seen him lately, but like he is not football built anymore. He looks like he is like <laughs> uh, built for long distance running these days. Like the, the amount of calories and the work you have to do to have that like football muscle mass is different. And I, th- I just, I think he's probably pretty happy being out of the game. Uh, had a lot of injuries, not a great time in Indy. I just, I, I don't know if I could see it, but man, that would be, that would be incredible. Uh, that would yeah. be, I would be, I would elevate from my chair live on TV. Yeah. He, he kind of reminds me of Jake Plummer of like after football, just is enjoying life to the fullest. Yeah. And there, there's been very few sightings of Andrew Luck. And I think the reason is because he's just really enjoying retirement, not being in the spotlight. He's I don't think he's ever really been one that loved the spotlight. He loved football. He just didn't always want to be out there in front of everybody all the time. Mm-hmm. And like I said, he, he's also a really smart guy. He doesn't need football to have a career and to have a life. And he made a ton of money, so it's not like he even has to go work anymore. But, uh, but yeah, I think he's just one of those guys. He he can be happy wherever he's at. If he's playing football, he's gonna be happy. If he's doing something else, he's gonna be happy too. Now, Justin Simmons, obviously, would love to have him back. Um, I just I think that that bridge has probably been burned at this point, and you know, it, it's sad to see end of a legacy because he really is probably the best player the Broncos have had when you're looking at the last 10 years, it's been Justin Simmons, Von Miller. Uh, but well, uh, okay. But Von Miller was still, he was <sighs> okay. Yeah. I mean, there, there's only, we only had him for a few years there, I guess of the last 10. He's only been gone for two years, right? Three years. Has he? Jeez. Okay. It feels like forever long. Rams okay. chiefs chiefs. He won with the Rams. So it's been three cycles, right? So I probably okay. still, I probably still would go Vaughn, uh, seven out of ten, um, but uh, that's just because I'm pass rusher obsessed, um, and I guess the league is too compared to safeties, uh, based on the safety exodus we saw this season. But yeah, I mean, 
Mr. Bronco, Justin Simmons, I hope he lands a good spot. I hope he wins some damn football games. Love to see him in the playoffs as long as it's not keeping Denver out. Uh, Zach Powers, if quarterbacks have to go to a good situation, tell me why the Broncos draft a quarterback this year and why we have a good situation. I talked about it a little bit earlier, but I think the Broncos are more so tearing down the defense and uh, hopefully keeping a lot of the offensive infrastructure in place. I mean, really, the only person you've lost on offense have been Cush- Cushenberry and Judy. Right, I can't yeah. think of anybody else really. You bring you brought back Trout- Troutman, yay! Uh, he had Sutton back. You brought in Josh Reynolds. I mean, Reynolds might be an upgrade to Judy scheme wise. I mean, who knows? I probably yeah. not from a statistical uh, standpoint, but he's an option uh, there. You have another year in the scheme, and you have assets to improve the roster still. So, I mean, I think if this was a full teardown and terrible team, and not around the quarterback, you'd already see Bowles gone. You'd probably see Sutton gone. You might see some other P Ryan may be gone as well, but they kept a lot of their offensive pieces in here where it's not a great situation for a young quarterback. Like you talked about Minnesota, but it's not, you know, Oh my God, this guy is going to be sacrificed to the wolves level of lacking talent around him. Yeah. Yeah. And the offensive line, like I said, four pieces coming back minors. He could end up getting the top guard contract next year, next off season possible not saying he's the best guard but i mean he's he's up there he, he's a very very good guard ben powers played better as the season went on mike mcglinchey played better but played better as the season went on garrett bowles is a i'd say a top 12 left tackle in football depending i mean you could even rank him a little bit higher than that i think he he's underrated by a lot of people and you got a, a few center options from the draft these last couple of years that you're going to hope one of those guys can step in and be a, a great player for you. So I, I think the offensive line is very well set. You have a, a, a pretty good running back room. I wouldn't say it's great. You know, we're, we're, I'm hoping Javante can get closer to what he was as a rookie compared to what he was this last year, you know, another year separated from his injury. P Ryan's a very good number two. And like I said, wide receiver, it's not a great room, but it, it's, it's a good enough room. You know, Sutton, he, he's a low-end number one wide receiver. He can go make the tough catches for a young quarterback. He can go up in the red zone, get you some, some nice touchdowns that maybe other players cannot make. Um, Tim Patrick, if he can stay healthy, mm-hmm. that, that's another 800, 900-yard kind of guy, five-touchdown kind of player. And adding Reynolds, like you said, you still have Mims who can be that wild card player that can really turn a, a five yard pass into a 80 yard touchdown. Um, so you have an, a nice room. It, it's, it's not got anybody that's going to be elite by any means, but you've got probably five or six guys that you can put on the field and feel pretty comfortable that they can go make a play for you. So yeah. for, for a young quarterback, th- there's been a lot worse situations than what one would walk into. And then Sean Payton, of course, is the, the X factor in all of this, like his time in with the saints, they had usually one really good receiver and then a bunch of kind of no names. Mm-hmm. They usually had a pretty good tight end. Uh, sometimes an elite tight end Broncos don't have that obviously. And then they had dynamic running backs and a great offensive line. And yeah. and he obviously drew Brees played at an all pro level for many, many years with that kind of setup. Um, so I, I don't think he needs the greatest talent to make his system work. Yeah. It helps, but he doesn't need it to, to function like some other coaches would. But I think he wouldn't turn his nose up at it either. Right. So I think yeah. the offensive yeah, yeah. line is the basis, the quarterback's the basis, but he needs the offensive line too. And then off of that, he believes he can scheme guys open. Uh, so we'll see. Um, uh, the further we move on from the Russell Wilson era and everything, the more of the onus of responsibility for the product on the field shifts onto Sean Payton. Uh, right now, George Payton's the next one in the crosshairs just because the state of the roster, Hackett move, uh, it's obviously the Russell Wilson move. I would not be surprised if Payton was gone. I said this last year, but I wouldn't be surprised if he was gone after the draft this year. We'll see. Uh, but crosshair is more so on him right now. But as we move further along, it's Sean Payton's team. And if they win, it's his glory if they lose it's his fault uh, so that's kind of where we're getting at mike edel comes in hey nick and carl dreading reaching and trading away our future for a quarterback bust go broncos well hopefully they don't do that but uh, let's see them play it's, out first i'm always a skeptic but uh, i don't i would hope for the best there yeah i mean you miss 
hundred percent of the shots you never take. So at some point you got to take a shot and you just hope that it is the right one. And we'll just have to see. I mean, Sean Payton said, Hey, we're better at this than others at picking a quarterback. I, I really hope that is not pride. I hope that is truly, yeah, we're really smart about this. We, we know what a quarterback can, can and can't do and we'll make it work. Yeah. Yep. Doing the best they can. Talk about doing the best. Coach says, a good afternoon, gents. Somebody sounds better than they did Monday morning. That's good. Uh, I was a struggle bus, but I didn't want to leave you guys hanging. I uh, love the show. Keep up the hard work. Can't wait for April 22nd with a uniform reveal. Hopefully it's good. Uh, excited to see that. And getting back here to Mike Kless, what he, Kless, what he had to say. Talked about the Broncos coming two new quarterbacks before the start of the year. He mentioned, you know, quarterback in the first round, but maybe not having the ammo to go up and get a guy up early. I think Denver, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's hard to say, right? But it's going to be costly and it's going to be hard to outbid the Vikings. I think Denver's only real hope to move up into the top for a court for, for a quarterback is that New England says they don't want one and they trade off a three to Minnesota. And then the four is open for business. It's a race between the Giants, the Broncos, and the Raiders, then and Denver has a shot. Uh, but if New England sits there at three and they say they're taking a quarterback, I don't see how Denver outbids Minnesota. Uh, just with the ample capital that they have to go do it. Uh, but <clears throat> that's a uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. As far as uh, what else Cliss said, he mentioned that Denver's cornerback, we kind of talked about it earlier, <coughs> excuse me, uh, cornerback, probably day three. Uh, you have a lot of assets there already. You kind of want to see what you have there. Um, but he mentioned, besides quarterback in the first round, he mentioned offensive tackle. It was a good draft this year for offensive tackle. Peyton likes the offensive line. Watch out for offensive tackle. And he mentioned edge rusher, which feels, you know, confirmation bias to me because those are positions that we've talked about a lot on here uh, being, if not quarterback, probably look that way. Uh, and they mentioned, he mentioned Garrett Bowles still being here, but Garrett Bowles only one year left on his contract. That offensive tackle would still make sense uh, for the Denver. And it might maybe even a situation where you bring in a tackle and then turn around and flip bowls uh, after that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. I saw somebody earlier said that there was a, a draft podcast that had the Broncos trading their third round pick and Cortland Sutton for a second round pick. And I mean, that's what it takes. Part of me is like, ah, I, I could see that being about the right value. Um, but I could see that with Garrett Bowles where he's worth probably, probably about a third round pick because of his contract, I would say he, he's at a very premium position. So it raises that stock. You can maybe get a late second round pick if somebody at the end of round one is sitting there saying, Hey, we did not get into this offensive tackle draft because they all got taken before we got them. Okay, here we go. Got Garrett Bowles. Um, and then you can use that to go get your, your quarterback, whatever. Um, you know, I, I could see something like that from the Broncos. If they take that offensive tackle early on and are just like, Hey, we can't pass on a true left tackle that could be here for the next 15 years as our blindside protector. And we believe this guy could be that kind of talent. I, I would, I wouldn't have a problem with that one bit. Yeah, I wouldn't either. And uh, edge rusher makes a lot of sense too. You have your top two edge rushers sitting uh, set to hit free agency after this year. Benito's Benito's a useful piece, but he's kind of a, he's a third down specialist, right? A pass rush specialist where first and second down, you lose a lot of that value. Uh, like him more rotationally love him as one of your top three. Uh, but maybe not the straw that stirs the drink up front. So first round pick at edge makes some sense to uh, talk a lot about trading back. So shout out to Cliss for that. Cause that makes a lot of sense for the Broncos. The other two big things he took away um, from the Broncos uh, team building prospect. And it goes back to building infrastructure for the quarterback. Talked a lot about running back day two. We already talked about that a bit. And he also talked about tight end. Uh, we know George Payton mentioned tight end a lot. Uh, we know, I think Sean Payton mentioned it too in the uh, combine press conference the thing that kind of bugs me about that is not really a great tight end draft class and last year was they kind of missed the boat there now there's a lot of talk the broncos tried pretty hard to move up for some tight ends in the draft and you know we were kind of chastising them for trading up earlier so i guess i'm glad they didn't trade up more than they could have but like luke musgrave sam laporta michael mayer uh some they had a chance at tucker craft but he's not as much of a pass weapon more of an inline kind of guy uh but tight end is the other big takeaway i have from the uh Cliss interview on uh, let's talk Broncos that Broncos are <clears throat> certainly searching, searching to add tight end and that anything they get from Dulcich is gravy, but they are not, they won't want to be in a situation where they don't have to depend on him at all. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and 
you mentioned running back. Um, Peyton has proven over and over again that running back is very important to him, whether that's a good thing or not. I mean, his very first pick as a Saints head coach was Reggie Bush. And then you're looking at uh, like Mark Ingram, another first round running back that he took back in 2011. And I'm trying to remember, let's see. Then they took uh, Kamara. Third. I think he was a second round pick. Is that right? Early third. Early third. Okay. And so, yeah, obviously running back has been something that he's very much looked at. If we can add a piece to this group that can be a weapon in many different ways. I mean, that, that was the big thing about Reggie Bush, Kamara, um, and Ingram is they were, they were multi, you know, they weren't just a, Hey, we're going to run you up the middle 20 times a game. It's, they could be a receiving option, blocking option that they could do a little bit of it all. And so if you can find a running back that can do that, I could see the Broncos using a, a decently high pick. I think going earlier than people think, you know, this isn't a great running back class, but it does seem like third round and on that there's a nice group of running backs that could be a nice compliment piece on this team. Yeah, no, without a doubt, there's, there's talent to be had middle of the draft at running back still. Uh, the other big takeaway is that he talked about running back. He expects Broncos to add two before the start of the season next year. He expects one in the draft, but the way he worded it, I interpreted it as, as it's happening during the draft, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a drafted quarterback. Uh, and he talked about potentially trading for a quarterback if the board falls a certain way. Uh, so I'm curious, maybe that's a Zach Wilson conversation. If the Giants feel feisty, I wonder if that's a Daniel Jones conversation, if they move up for a quarterback. Uh, so I'll be curious uh, to see what happens with the Broncos hunting for quarterbacks out there. Is there any other, I mean, just trying to connect dots here. Those are the only two that really stand out to me. I mean, guess if, uh, cause you can't really see a lot of these teams that have quarterbacks. They just signed already flipping them, you know, like Minshew with the Raiders. That's not happening, but they would they right. trade Aiden O'Connell. I mean, I, I guess he's gotta be a bit <laughs> super cheap, right? Uh, Seattle's also an interesting one. There's been some panic smoke there. Obviously they have a connection there with Grubb as their new offensive coordinator who was the offensive coordinator with him in, uh, Washington. I think he even connected with him back in Indiana before, uh, he went to Washington. So maybe panics goes and then is Geno Smith available. So it sounds like the Broncos have a lot of options and it's not just the drafted quarterbacks, but it's when quarterbacks come off the board, if other quarterbacks on those teams become available. Yeah, I, there's definitely going to be a lot of moving pieces there. And Sean Payton has shown time and time again, he'll get creative in how he goes and gets the guys that he wants. You know, if, if this option comes off the board, he's got three other options in, in the bank. Like it's not a, a Bo Nix or bust kind of situation. I know a lot of people, and we've talked a lot about him on this, this show. Um, Nix, if that is the direction the Broncos go, that's great. But I don't think you should get into the mindset of if we don't get Knicks, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. That's where you get into trouble. Like I said, I mean, there's going to be some teams that have Rattler ahead of a lot of these guys because he just has such incredible arm talent. Yeah. And you, you try to look at – this is where you, you separate, I, I guess, talking about Drew Brees when he was with Purdue. Purdue was not a great team. And so yeah. some people were, were discrediting him because they're sitting there saying, well – you know, he didn't win all these games, but he didn't have the talent around him to always go out there and win. Like, could he, did he show that he could elevate above what people expected? And for me, like Spencer Rattler, he's one of those guys. I think he did a great job of actually elevating that South Carolina team above the talent that they actually had on the roster. Um, we can argue that back and forth. I mean, he, he made plenty of mistakes. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of bad on that tape. And there's still that questionable character side of things that I still think out you know, us on the outside can't fully know how he's going to be as a character person on and off the field. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, if the Broncos take him third round or like, Hey, we, we really think we got something here with this guy. I mean, crazier things have happened. I mean, you, you talked about him really Dak Prescott. He was a fourth round pick turned into a pretty darn good quarterback in the NFL. Uh, we just had Russell Wilson. He wasn't great for us, but for a third round pick, that guy was a pretty darn good quarterback. Yeah, um, yeah. So like I said, it doesn't have to be in the first round and maybe you just take a chance on one of those guys in the third round 
And then if they aren't working out, if they're not showing something, it's easy to move on. I mean, heck, Carl, I'm rude, not rude. That's the word vicious. I don't know what it is. Like, let's say you trade back multiple times to get to pick 30 and you take Nick's Rattler Penix there. If you're picking in the top five next year and you have a chance at a quarterback, I don't give a flying bleep that you used a late first round pick the year before you take the quarterback again. Oh, the guy didn't get a fair shot. I mean, he got more of a shot than most guys do and didn't deliver. Could he be something later? Maybe, but I like this guy evaluate him more than I did this guy a year ago. So I'm probably going to go with the better guy. I don't care. Uh, you had a chance tough. It's not about fair. It's about winning football games. Uh, yeah. so does that make me, uh, you know what? I don't know. Uh, maybe, <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, Chicago just kind of ran into that situation with Justin Fields. Like yeah. he showed some promise, but then you're also looking at this Caleb Williams going, man, this guy, like he looks really, really special. How can we pass on this for a guy that has shown some flashes and is in the last year of his rookie contract? Yeah, we got to make this decision. Like, it, I, I know some people are going back and forth of what, what they should do, and I'm going, there's no going back and forth. Like, th this, for me at least, it was an easy decision. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe Justin Fields does turn into something down the road and you're really kicking yourself, but I'm sorry. I would take the chance on the guy with that huge upside with the number one overall pick. Yeah. Uh, we got one more super chat getting in here before we got to get on out. What do you guys think about Drake May's delivery? The arm motion is a little elongated, but man, he's got so much power behind it. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's any longer than Penix is, but it's being dissected more like Penix has got a big winding motion still, but it's very strong. Uh, some some of May's throws are inaccurate, but they're inaccurate in a way it's like they always look inaccurate because they're lasers, if that makes sense. Like, you know, if you have a little like whole shot kind of things, like you have a chance for your running back to, or your wide receiver to at least kind of run to it, make it look a little better. Uh, where like when he misses, it's like ugly. Uh, but I mean, he has some concerns about the elongated motion and the delivery. But, you know, I can say that about most of the quarterbacks. I think Nix's accuracy is a little bit overrated i see a lot of like at the very edge of the periphery of the catch radius for guys like behind the line of scrimmage it's like man catch him in stride there and it could be a bigger play less some meat on the bone uh jj mccarthy throwing left i mean uh-oh uh overstrides a bit it's a ball sails on him uh so that's a there's some questions uh for all those guys i mean they're really the only guy they all have questions but like caleb williams probably has the least questions from his on the field uh perspective but I don't know. At the end of the day, I have an ethos for drafting quarterbacks. I'm swinging for the bleep and fences. Uh, so give me the guy that with, as long as they have good enough intelligence and work ethic, cause you got to have those intangibles still, but give me the biggest, fastest, strongest guy with the big arm. And that to me is Drake may, uh, after Caleb Williams in this class. So, uh, yeah, again, I've, it's hard to evaluate quarterbacks, especially all the intangible <laughs> stuff though, where I sit, I'm going to evaluate the, the, the tangibles. I, I think there's times with may that when I watch him, there's two things that kind of pop up one there's times I think he trusts his arm a little bit too much and he'll try to fit a ball into a window that he probably shouldn't. And maybe that part of that is this last year, especially with North Carolina, he did not have the talent around him. And so there's times he had to force those kind of throws just to go out there and win a game. Um, but the second thing is because he has such a great arm and this happens to a lot of guys, sometimes their technique just goes away because they just have a great arm. Like they don't have to have the lower body perfect to be able to get a ball down the field or, you know, laser one down the middle. Now, Drake may, I think he was the best quarterback of this draft when throwing over the middle of the field, which is a great fit with Sean Payton. If I remember, I have PFF, I think put that out there. Um, but like I said, there's just times where it, he has a, a bad lower body and it will lead to some inaccurate passes when he doesn't have to. Yeah. And those are just things get cleaned up, be in a better situation than what he was there in North Carolina. Cause like I said, he had to overcome, it was not only having not the greatest talent around him. I don't think he was in the best system by any means either. A new system that, that, too. Longo went on to Wisconsin this year. So he had to learn a new system yeah. as well. So two different systems. I didn't, I didn't like they're doing their offensive line was, it's kind of crazy. I'm trying to think of like the offensive line rankings for the top quarterbacks this year. And Penix, Nix, and McCarthy had unbelievable offensive lines. Williams, May, Stinkers. Um, Daniels had a pretty good offensive line too. And then there was 
Rattler's offensive line, which is like <laughs> hide the kids uh, because yeah. it is it is scary time. Uh, yeah. But guys, we got to get on out of here. Final uh, one coming in here. I do want to say hello to uh, Mike Naylor. Seeing coming with questions here it says offensive players come off the board early. We could take the best defensive player available, Turner verse maybe offensive line. I think edge and offensive line. If you like that, we talked about it a little earlier. Uh, I think defensive tackle is probably not on the board at twelve just because there isn't that unquestionable dude. I think if one of Newton or Murphy came in and tested, you know, like at Oliver level or, you know, just like that kind of freak for being smaller, I would be in, I'd be willing to have a conversation. They didn't test like those like absolute freaks to me where it's like they're first round guys, but they're not top 12 kind of guys in my book. So that's where I'm at. Edge offensive tackle. If one of the top wide receivers falls, giddy up. I don't care. Uh, It's not happening. (laughs) Uh, But uh, then of course, quarterback. Right now it's if what if you trade back to say pick 20 and one of those defensive tackles is right there yeah i can be okay with that you know anywhere 20 to 25 i think that's a pretty good spot for for them to go but you're right pick 12 that's a little bit early in in my book when there's probably going to be a much higher rated talent a uh, true blue chip i mean if you do mock drafts and i know obviously they're not perfect on how they're going to play out for things but especially if those four quarterbacks go there's a really good chance either a good edge player or a good offensive tackle maybe one of those wide receivers falls to you there at pick 12 yep you're absolutely right man that's a great call um i'm not against any of them really so we'll see what happens uh gotta wrap it up go though guys got some uh, baby duties and stuff to get on to so appreciate you guys hanging out with us tonight uh, make sure you're following carl and i on twitter carl's at carl dumber mhh I'm at Nick Kendall MHH. Also follow us at Mile High Huddle. If you haven't done so yet, join us at facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle and facebook.com forward slash Mile High Huddle pod. And as the ticker says here underneath, please subscribe, like, and share over on your social media platforms, uh, wherever you're at. Shout out to all of our super chats today. Rob Buxbaum, Dakota Marquez, Darren Kendall a couple times, DTR, Chase Wellner, uh, James Edwards, EJ, $100 ruse. God bless you. That's a big one. Mike Edel coming in. Coach Chris as well, $20. Mike Edel again. So, Thank you guys so much. Helping keep the lights on, keeping uh, building the Broncos. We're gonna Broncos are gonna be building for a bit, folks. It looks like so. You better keep the lights on on here. Uh, appreciate everyone. If you have any questions or whatever, hit us up on Twitter. Uh, you know we're we're there. We like to probably spend too much time on the old Twitter machine. But uh, have a great one, guys. Any final thoughts, Carl? No, I, I think this was a great conversation with all of you guys. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for not just being like it's all about the quarterback and trying to figure out some other ways to really build beyond just the quarterback position um, because, you know, unfortunately in football, you got to remember it, it's a team game. You can have a great quarterback and they can help you win a lot of games. It's the most important piece, but those other pieces still matter. Yeah. It's a team game in the end. Quarterback's more of a multiple shots kind of thing for me. It's like a decade perspective versus a single season. It's one reason I'm not buying all in on Brock Purdy, but I would buy in on somebody like Justin Herbert, but we'll see. Um, uh, God bless you guys. Have a great one. Hope you had a good week and we'll see you again next Tuesday. Uh, Choose kindness, compassion, go Broncos.